Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, chapter 22. Entanglement in fruitive activities, text 12 through 15. We'll just chant verse 12. Adjastira charanam yo. Veda garba saharshi be. Yogeshvarai Kumar Hajai Siddhaya Yoga Pravartakai Aja Stira Charanam Yo Veda Garba Saharshi B Yogeshvarai Kumar Hajai Siddhaya Yoga Pravartakai Ajastira Charanam Yo Veda Garba Saharshi P Yogeshvarai Kumar Ajai Siddhaya Yoga Pravartakai Vaishnavis, Aja, the Creator, Lord Brahma. Stidacharanam, of the immobile and mobile manifestations. Ya, he who, Veda Garbha, the repository of the Vedas. Saha, along with Rishi B, the sages. Yoga Ishvarai, 
with great mystic yogis, Kumara Ajay, the Kumaras and others, Siddhai, with the perfected living beings, Yoga Prabhartakai, the authors of the yoga system. Translation. My dear mother, someone may worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead with a special self-interest. But even demigods, such as Lord Brahma, great sages such as Sunat Kumar, and great moonies such as Marichi have to come back to the material world again at the time of creation. When the interaction of the three modes of material nature begins, Brahma, who is the creator of this cosmic manifestation and who is full of Vedic knowledge, and the great sages who are the authors of the spiritual path and the yoga system, come back under the influence of the time factor. They are liberated by their non-fruitive activities and they attain the first incarnation of the Purusha. But at the time of creation, they come back in exactly the same forms and positions as they had previously. Purport. That Brahma becomes liberated is known to everyone, but he cannot liberate his devotees. Demigods like Brahma and Lord Shiva cannot give liberation to any living entity. As it is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita, only one who surrenders unto Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, can be liberated from the clutches of Maya. Brahma is called here Ajastira Charanam. He is the original, first created living entity. And after his own birth, he creates the entire cosmic manifestation. He was fully instructed in the matter of creation by the Supreme Lord. Here he is called Veda Garbha, which means that he knows the complete purpose of the Vedas. He is always accompanied by great personalities as Marichi, Kashyapa, and the seven sages, as well as by great mystic yogis, the Kumaras, and many other spiritually advanced living entities. But he has his own interest, separate from the Lord's. Veda Drishya means that Brahma sometimes thinks that he's independent of the Supreme Lord, or he thinks of himself as one of the the three equally independent incarnations. Brahma is entrusted with creation, Vishnu maintains, and Rudra, Lord Shiva, destroys. The three of them are understood to be incarnations of the Supreme Lord in charge of the three different material modes of nature. But none of them is independent of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Here the word, Beda Drishya, occurs because Brahma has a slight inclination to think that he is independent, that he is as independent as Rudra. Sometimes Brahma thinks that he is independent of the Supreme Lord. And the worshiper also thinks that he is independent. And the worshiper also thinks that Brahma is independent. For this reason, after the destruction of this material world, when there is again creation by the interaction of the material modes of nature, Brahma comes back. Although Brahma reaches the Supreme Personality of Godhead as the first Purusha in incarnation, Mahavishnu, who is full with transcendental qualities, he cannot stay in the spiritual world. The specific significance of his coming back may be noted, Brahma and the great Rishis and the great master of yoga, Shiva, are not ordinary living entities. They are very powerful and have all the perfections of mystic yoga, but still they have an inclination to try to become one with the Supreme, and therefore they have to come back. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is accepted 
that as long as one thinks he is equal with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he is not completely purified or knowledgeable. In spite of going up to the first Purush avatar, Mahavishnu, after the dissolution of this material creation, such personalities again fall down or come back to the material creation. It is a great fall down on the part of the impersonalists to think that the Supreme Lord appears within a material body and that one should therefore not meditate upon the form of the Supreme, but should meditate instead on the formless. For this particular mistake, even the great mystic yogis or great stalwart transcendentalists also come back again when there is creation. All living entities, other than the impersonalists and monists, can directly take to devotional service in full Krishna consciousness and become liberated by developing transcendental loving service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Such devotional service develops in the degrees of thinking of the Supreme Lord as master, as friend, as son, and at last, as lover. These distinctions in transcendental variegatedness must always be present. <clears throat> Translation again. My dear mother, someone may worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead with a special self-interest, but even demigods such as Lord Brahma, great sages such as Sanat Kumar, and great munis such as Marichi, have to come back to the material world again at the time of creation. When the interaction of the three modes of material nature begins, Brahma, who is the creator of this cosmic manifestation and who is full of Vedic knowledge, and the great sages, who are the authors of the spiritual path and the yoga system, come back under the influence of the time factor. They are liberated by their non-fruitive activities and they attain the first incarnation of the Purusha. But at the time of creation, they come back in exactly the same forms and positions as they had previously. Om Agana Timadandasya Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshun Maritang Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nitananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare In the previous chapter of this third canto, Lord Kapilade has explained to his mother the path of adverse fruitive activities. Now, from the bhakti point of view, all fruitive activities, all karmic activities are adverse. But the Vedic knowledge offers the whole purview, the whole scope for how human beings should make some kind of progress. And for those who are dedicated to material life, the real way to go for being a genuine materialist is pious activities, positive karmic activities. In other words, as I often explain, it's a great compliment to call someone a materialist today. <laughs> materialist implies one who knows how to enjoy material life now and in the future. But look at what you call materialists today. Look at whom you call materialists. Uh, they specialize in momentary, temporary flashes of so-called happiness. And they're so desperate for that and become so proud just by their possessing a few glimmers of happiness. And meanwhile, they destroy their own habitat. They destroy their own environment. And often they say, just like for example, 
in the USA, the city of Miami, big resort city right on the coast. Everyone knows rising sea levels will cause a massive problem for the city even more than right now. But what do so many real estate developers say there? Well, the real destruction won't happen until 2050, and by that time I'll be gone, so. <laughs> this is materialism in the age of gully. <laughs> or they say, look, whatever problems will be around in 30 years are for the young people to figure out. We had to deal with problems in our time, so they should deal with the problems that come in their time. <laughs> this is called intergenerational tyranny. By our so-called enjoyment now, we screw up the world for the children and for the grandchildren. We tyrannize their future. They'll figure something out. I mean, that's what it means to, you know, be smart. <laughs> you got to sort things out for yourself, just like we did. Right. <laughs> so in this way, uh, human beings in the name of being materialists, in other words, showing they have some, or claiming they have some expertise, in this way they destroy the world now and in the future. So it's an undue compliment to call anyone a materialist these days because you're implying they have expertise in executing material life. But you don't see that. Look at the results. You simply see expertise in destruction accompanied by momentary glimpses of technological prowess which always have some side effect, some bad consequence, along with whatever convenience such technological prowess gives. I always like the way Srila Prabhupada once responded uh, in a discussion with devotees uh, about modern or contemporary so-called advancement, technological prowess, seemingly endless shower of conveniences. He said, we're not against that. We're not against the current material progress. We're not against it, even though we know it's suicidal. <laughs> this is the tragedy, that because people are so attached to the wrong goal in life, they can't properly have a conception of progress. And, we, and even devotees become affected by such illusions. So we were talking about who is a real materialist. And in the previous chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Kapil Dev is describing the path of adverse karmic activities, bad karma so that your destination is, is hell. Now in this chapter, he's describing the path of good karma. <laughs> Still, it's called entanglement in fruitive activities, entanglement in karmic activities. How does that entanglement Look, when you're on a winning streak, <laughs> when you're on the good foot, how does that karmic entanglement look? It is cyclic. What goes around comes around. As Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita, chine punye marcha lokam vasanti. You go up to the heavenly planets, and then when you've exhausted your stock of karmic of good karma, you collapse back down to the earth planet, the middle planetary system. In this way, you're coming and going, coming and going. You may see someone currently in this age of Kali 
who seems to have so much opulence, so much fame, so much uh, influence. But then you have to think, how long is this going to last? And what will be their destination in their next life? This is what Lord Capil Aid is teaching us. He's giving you the overview, the cosmological overview. Just like the mothers here, they're concerned about the future of their children. Someone will say, oh, how are you raising your child so that the child will become a nice teenager, which is always the challenge. And then after the child becomes a nice teenager, what will be the child's career? How spiritual will your child be? How materially expert will your child be? But does the concern end there? You may hear people say that what happens after I give up this body? What happens after death? Why well, do I have to worry about that? Why ruin your present moments of potential pleasure by being in such anxiety about what happens after death? That interferes with the, the magic of the moment. People either outright say that or they're just so dull they just don't know. Uh, future, uh, after death, uh, isn't that some kind of religious stuff? Uh. <laughs> Yet, you see in their very inexpert attempts at material life, they're concerned with the future. What about education? That's a future investment. Here in New Zealand, you see so many young people taking out massive loans to study something at the university. And often they're studying something that will have no economic consequence in the future. It's a great business for those in charge. One devotee was telling me when he was based in Hamilton how a lecturer, a professor at Waikato University, came to him very disgusted. He said, I just attended a board meeting that the university had with all its department heads and lecturers and this and that, and they were trying to plot a path forward to keep uh, the student economy going, to keep the Waikato University positioned to get to maintain its market share, in case you thought it was all about learning. <laughs> and so one, uh, one of the executives of the university presented a new course in some kind of very nebulous counseling and therapy. And he said, this will definitely be a money spinner. <laughs> and so the, <laughs> the lecturer who was talking to the devotee said, I raised my hand, I said, this is cheating. You make this, the students sign up for this particular course of study, some nebulous, vague form of counseling. There are no jobs for that. And, they, and the, 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 the chiefs of the university just looked at him and basically told him to shut up. <laughs> Look, you know, <laughs> you're being pie in the sky. Let's just deal with the facts. We need students to enroll. If the students think that this is a cool course, that's all that counts. Never mind that they're going twenty, thirty thousand dollars in debt in order to, to, to pay for it. That, that is not, that, that's not the point. The university machine has to grind on. People are thinking of the future. Oh, I should pay that money, take up this nebulous course of study, which I like. It seems like, yeah, it would be kind of nice. Often when I'm speaking at our outreach centers, the loft or the bhakti lounge, I ask the young people, so what are you doing? Well, I'm studying uh, cultural anthropology. That's a very nice, it's a very interesting subject matter, but uh, by the way, uh, how are you paying for it? Well, what do you mean, how am I paying for it? Of course, uh, took out loans. Uh, well, how much loans do you think you're gonna have by the time you finish? 
Oh, about 30000 oh. I said, how are you going to pay that back? I don't know. <laughs> but right now, I, like to, I think I like to study these things. So they're hoping that I'm doing something good for the future. But then you ask the same person, what about your future after giving up this body? Oh, why do I got to think about that? What's that got to do with anything? Be practical. You Hare Krishnas, you get so gloomy sometimes. <laughs> Just like this young man here, why does he have to think about what his next body is going to be? Why, why put these complexes upon him? <laughs> He's got a teenage body, it's full of vibrancy and hormones and potential. <laughs> why, why ruin his magic moments by having him think about what is your next body going to be? Are you going to maximize your human form of life? <laughs> Yet, people, they're hypocrites. They are concerned about the future, but it's about the future in terms of certain things. Just like sooner or later, persons become concerned. Who's my partner going to be? And they hope it's going to last into the future. But still, whether it lasts or not, it's a future investment. And then once the partner is there, then they start thinking generally about children. And then what will the children's future be? And then the grandchildren come. What kind of future will the grandchildren have? This is all future investment. But when it comes to thinking what your next body will be, oh, that's kind of... Prabhupada talk. <laughs> That's old-fashioned Hare Krishna stuff. <laughs> Think about your self-esteem. <laughs> Think about your financial future. If you ask someone beyond their teenage years who is in their 40s, 50s, they're thinking, well, what about retirement? Do I have my own property? Do I have investments? Who's going to take care of me when I'm in my old age? They're concerned about the future. But then, what is your next body going to be? Oh, what's I got to do with anything? <laughs> Why is that so important? So this information that Lord Kapil Dev is giving is very important. He's, he's balanced. <laughs> the Bhagavatam is so comprehensive. The previous chapter, what is the result of bad karma, loosely speaking? This chapter, what is the result of good karma? So you're getting in this verse, in case you're wondering, an example of even Lord Brahma and great sages like the Kumaras, great Munis like Marichi, if they have some desire to be independent of the Supreme Personality Guided, they come back. There's a partial annihilation of the universe after every day of Brahma. And so, most of the universe is destroyed. And Brahma and such sages and mystic yogis, they come back for the next kalpa. And at the end of Brahma's life, if they're not completely free of the desire to be independent of the Supreme Personality Goddess, they come back again. Even they can make it to the causal ocean, this verse and purpose describing. They attain the first incarnation of the Purusha, Mahavishnu, the causal ocean, but they can't cross over into the spiritual world because they have that independent desire. So now you may say, this is a fine point, you may say, well, really? Brahma? He's the head of our Sampradaya, and the four Kumaras, and they have to come back to the material world again? But you see, the Bhagavatam, the Acharyas explain, is so comprehensive and cosmological, you're hearing about not just the Brahma and the great sages of this universe, you're hearing about 
those personalities in many universes. So it's not automatic that in every universe these extraordinary personalities are pure devotees or go back to Godhead immediately. So therefore, you're getting this example given by Lord Kapilade to his mother. These are, you know, what would you say, intergalactic or inter, interuniversal <laughs> examples. The Brahma in this universe says Govindam Adi Purusham Tamahamajami. But there are countless Brahmas, as Krishna demonstrated. Countless universes with countless Brahmas, with countless Yoga Pravartakas, founders of the mystic yoga system. If they're thinking in some way that they have a separate desire, and that separate desire, if you want to get into it, is explained in the purport that they think, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is actually formless. And when you hear about the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you're hearing about the spiritual essence, which we all have. And because there's that essence within the body of the Supreme Lord, there's also that essence within us, and we're equal. <laughs> now, of course, Bhagavatam explains to us that there's no difference between Krishna's inside and outside, his body, his mind, or his self. But those who are distorted by impersonal knowledge have that tendency to think that Krishna, the Vishnu avatars, they are the greatest productions of Maya. We worship them because they're the best manifestations of Maya. And you can use them to get high up on the yoga ladder. But once you're at the top of the yoga ladder, then you make your jump for Brahman, which is the essence of everything. This is a concoction. This means you will not get out of the material world because you haven't understood that Krishna's Satchitananda form has no difference between the body, the mind, the self. There's no within Krishna and without Krishna that's different. No self within and different from the body without. So we're getting such intriguing cosmological information. And the path to the heavenly planets, good karma, is a dead end because you exhaust your good karma and have to fall down. And the path of karma is very intricate. Remember the pastime of Maharaj Nriga, the Yadavas. Some of the Yadavas of the Dwarka personalities, when they were young, young boys, they were playing in the forest, persons like Samba and others. And in their playing, they came upon a huge dry well. And they came upon it because they were, somehow they became thirsty by, by the way the pastime energy was moving them. And they looked into the huge dry well and they saw a huge lizard. So being compassionate, the boys tried to get this huge lizard out of the bottom of the well. They tried making ropes, but they couldn't do it. So then Krishna came along and easily lifted the huge lizard out of the well. And by the touch of Krishna's hand, the huge lizard 
changed into the form of a beautiful demigod, a swargi. That means resident of the heavenly planets. And so Krishna knew exactly what, what was the story with this swargi who had the form of a lizard. So there is the swargi shining like the sun, beautiful demigod body. So Krishna asks, uh, can you kindly explain what's going on? Obviously, Krishna understood fully, but he wanted to have an instructional situation for the Yadavas because he noted these Yadavas sometimes get a bit proud and I want to teach them about brahmanas, the property of brahmanas, the sanctity of brahmanas, because the Yadavas are chatriyas. So Krishna had this devata speak, and the devata began explaining that if you've ever seen a list of super charitable philanthropic persons who accumulated unlimited amounts of punya, pious activity. If you've ever seen such a list, you might have seen my name on it. <laughs> this is a very uh, discreet way of saying, uh, actually, I'm pretty famous. <laughs> <laughs> It's like Sachi Sutta Prabhu saying, if you've ever seen a list of those who were at Nuvarshan in the very beginning, um, you might find my name on it. <laughs> That's a very nice way of, instead of saying, hey, I've been here since time immemorial, who are you? <laughs> Everything in Bhagavatam is so eloquent, you know. If you've ever seen a list of those who have done massive charity, you might have seen my name on it. <laughs> and then Nuga goes on to explain what happened. The charity he gave is unfathomable to our current understanding. He would give away countless cows. He would give away to the brahmanas gold and cloth and villages and girls to marry and elephants and he described his good karma in this way. He said, just like the stars in the sky, just like the particles of earth, soil, just like the drops in showering rain. That's how many cows I gave. <laughs> Meaning, the Acharya explained, you can't calculate how many cows he gave in charity. Just like you can't count all those things. That he gave the example of like the stars in the sky means the cows are very heavily, heavenly. That he said, like the drops in a rain downpour. Again, you can't, you can't calculate. And just like the rain, the drops in a downpour are constant. Similarly, he was constantly giving charity. So if you want to get into the details, the Acharyas explain that, <clears throat> yes, he's saying unlimited. But it's also a fact that if you give a cow in charity on a certain auspicious day or at an auspicious place like Kurukshetra, one cow equals 100,000 cows. <laughs> so there are all these Vedic intricacies. <laughs> which we have no idea of in this dense darkness of the age of Kali. <laughs> so, anyway, if you want to know the fine print. <laughs> so what happened? 
you know the story, the history. Into Maharaj Niga's herd, vast herd of cows, came a cow from another brahmana. It happens sometimes. Those who maintain cows know that sometimes cows and bulls jump the fence, they get out, they, uh, the neighbors have to bring them back, or scientists present them today are some kind of animate, potent, dynamic entities. No, they're just descriptions of patterns of nature. But the ordinary persons, they don't think like that. Oh, the law of this has been discovered, the law of gravity, the law of that. As if these laws in and of themselves generate an existential situation. Similarly, the law of karma doesn't act without someone dispensing justice. So Nigar was taken to see Yamaraj not to the part of Yamaraj's court where those going to hellish destinations are sent. No, he went to see Yamaraj in a special part reserved for those who are pious, but, there's, but there could be some discrepancy. So Yamaraj told him, well, you had this problem while you were alive in the previous body, you had this problem with the brahmanas, uh, with property belonging to brahmanas. So you have to suffer a bit for that. But let me tell you, your pious activities are so humongous, so massive in amount that there's no end to your enjoyment in the heavenly planets. Of course, there's an end, but meaning you'll never, we can't calculate the end of your stint in the heavenly planets. So Yamaraj asked him, what do you want first? The results of your bad karma or the results of your good karma? Now, what would you choose? You've got this one problem on your record. <laughs> <laughs> in your file. <laughs> There's one spot, black spot on a white cloth, and Yamaraja tipped him off. They'll, you've done so much pious activity, you've given so much charity, you, you, we can't see the end of your stay in the heavenly planets and heavenly enjoyment. But you've got this one issue. So what do you want to do? How do you want to, how do you want to, how do you want justice to be dispensed? Do you want the results of your bad karma first? Or do you want the results of your good karma first? So what would you choose? <laughs> Most everyone would say, well, let, 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 let's take the bad because happiness is much more appreciated after you suffer. Whereas if you enjoy first, and then the bad, oh, you feel so horrible. Oh, I had it so I had it made. I was enjoying like anything. Now I'm suffering. But if you suffer first, then once you get the happiness, oh, the, the mental uh, reverberation is much greater. Oh, I, I've made it now. I'm out of the storm. I'm enjoying. <laughs> So Nyika indeed thought like that. The material happiness will be better if I suffer first and then go for the unlimited stint in the heavenly planets. So Yamaraj said, all right, fall, down you go into a lizard body. <laughs> so that's why uh, this Swargi, this resident of the heavenly planets was in a lizard body and by the touch of Krishna, he resumed his devata status. And why was Krishna doing all this? He wanted to show his own dynasty, the problems that can come in karmic activity, especially when dealing with brahmanas. Now you might say, but didn't Krishna's personal entourage know all this? Yes, they did. But 
Krishna, like he's doing with Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita, is teaching a massive audience, <laughs> us, through the example of Arjuna or through the example of his teaching, his personal entourage in Dwarka. They, his entourage knew it all, but Krishna is just using them as a teaching medium. And he goes on for quite a few verses about what happens when you do any discrepancy with something belonging to a brahmana or when you disrespect brahmanas. Krishna really pours it on thick. You know, okay, you might say after one verse, two, two verses, enough is enough. We got the point. He became a lizard. We said, <laughs> no, the Bhagavatam goes on and on. If you unintentionally, like Niga, cause a problem to a Brahmana's property. This is what happens. If you intentionally cause a problem, it's even worse. If a government touches the property of a government, uh, property of a Brahmana, it's even worse. It goes on and on like this. So why is Krishna belaboring this point? Because he's doing it because in a real human society, you need a head on the social body. And that genuine head on the social body is so important that therefore there are all these injunctions against disturbing brahmanas, disturbing their property, and so forth. Because just like on your own body, the head is so important. You can lose a finger, you can lose a, a leg, you can lose an arm, but you cannot lose your head. Although, as Srila Prabhupada always pointed out, all the parts of the body are necessary for a fully functioning body, but still the head is most important. So it's not that these Vedic injunctions against disturbing brahmanas are just some kind of ritualistic fuddy-duddy, Hindu granny wisdom. No, they are very socially scientific. So we're getting the complete picture in Srimad Bhagavatam. You've heard about the destination of those performing hellish activities. And now you're finding out the destination of those performing heavenly activities. Either way, the good karma, the bad karma, you don't get out of the material world. You repeat. So the intelligent person gets tired of this. How do I put an end to this cycle? So you might say, and I've thought in my younger days as a devotee, I mean, what's all this information about the Swargis, the residents of the heavenly planets, Swargaloka, going to the heavenly planets? Uh, how does that relate to us now? But you see, the Bhagavatam is comprehensive even though there are very few people on the planet now who would qualify for <laughs> activities that would bring them to the heavenly planets in the next life, still you need to know about that. And it adds to the glory of bhakti for us to see that there's the path of good karma, there's the path of mystic yoga, there's the path of jnana yoga, metaphysical speculation, and far above all that in another dimension of its own is bhakti. In other words, Bhagavatam is not sectarian. It's, out, it's putting out before you all the possibilities, even though those, much of those possibilities are unattainable in this age of Kali. Still, the Bhagavatam is being fair. You could do this. You could choose to do good karma and go to the heavenly planets. It's unlikely in this age. You could try to do mystic yoga, uh, develop mystic powers, unlikely in this age. You could be a metaphysical speculator and try to speculate your way into Brahman, unlikely again these days. Or, kechit kevalaya bhaktya vasudeva prayana. You could, perform the poor, you could perform pure devotional service, which solves all the problems. Just like when the sun rises and the fog is dissipated. So this is the glory of Srimad Bhagavatam. It's not just saying, you got to do bhakti, and that's it. No explanation, no context, no other alternatives. No, there are other alternatives if you want to waste your life, if you want to revolve in the cycle of repeated birth and death. Here's how you do it. 
and you could get a, a nice prison cell <laughs> instead of a solitary confinement. You could get a prison cell with a TV and fresh air, and <laughs> or you could choose to get out of prison. <laughs> that is Shrimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> 